Welcome everyone um, to World Milk Day um, today. I done my part today and did milk my cows already. So um, we're happy to have you all joining in uh, on this second lecture sure. of uh, uh, this year's AIMA lecture series. And I'm happy that uh, my dear friend uh, and AIMA colleague Barbara Corson uh -huh. volunteered to take the lead in this. And I couldn't think of anyone else um, more suitable for that purpose. Uh, her being a retired um, a veterinarian pathologist and also cow enthusiast and also um, having um, dairy cows herself to be the moderator of this session. So in this case, I, I without further ado, I want to hand over to you, Barb, um, to do the moderation of today. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Klaus, and want to welcome everyone to the lecture series. Uh, I'm really grateful for everyone who showed up <laughs> And the, for the presenters who actually may not be here, but who sent in recorded presentations, dairying is a really important subject to me. As Klaus said, it's kind of my passion. <laughs> I think that dairy related skills and knowledge are among the most threatened of all historic skills. There are still plenty of dairy animals, but currently they're increasingly kept as part of industrial agriculture. And that means that more frequently they are not treated as individual animals or managed by humans who have knowledge and skills. Instead, they're viewed as production units and managed by machines and other technologies like pharmaceuticals or laboratory based genetic modifications. And these industrial technologies depend on petroleum and capital rather than human skills. Next slide, please. Um, but we are seeing signs that it's not a smart or sustainable system. And furthermore, we didn't always depend on it as we do today for thousands of years. In fact, people kept cattle and other dairy animals as part of a community. And the milk that the animals produced was just one of many contributions from the animals that became part of the culture. In many places around the world, the switch to industrialism has only recently occurred. And in some places, the switch has not occurred yet. Living without petroleum has never been easy, but it has been done. In theory, at least, we could do it better now and in the future if we combined past experience with current scientific understanding. Lecture series like this can contribute, admittedly in a small way, towards a future way of life in which humans, domestic animals, and the environment could all benefit. So this is the mindset with which I was approaching the World Day of Milk. And with that introduction, we'll get started with our first speaker, who is, so we'll have Dominique Frere, who is from France, talking about uh, ancient cheese artifacts. <laughs> and Professor S. Rajaswaran with Dairy Traditions in India. And our AIMA president, Klaus Krupp, talking about triple purpose cows cows for work, milk, and, and eventually meat. Hello, my name is Deborah Reed, and I'm the Curator of Agriculture and the Environment at the Henry Ford. Historical resources at the Henry Ford, a large museum complex in Dearborn, Michigan in the United States, document the roles of women and cows, cows being the primary source of milk in the United States historically. And collections show how the role of women on dairy farms changed over time from women providing the majority of labor to milk cows and to process dairy products until the early 20th century. And then men assumed increased responsibility for the milking duties on increasingly mechanized dairy farms. And yet there's a lot of uh, yeah, give and take in these two gendered ideas of the dairy business in the United States. The Henry Ford collections include rare survivors of women's workspaces. And we also have romanticized images of women in those workspaces. So between this aqua tent of a milkmaid that was printed in London in the early 19th century, and the De Laval cream separator advertisement of the early 20th century is this dairy building that was moved from coastal Maryland to Greenfield Village at the Henry Ford 
in the 1940s. The building affirms an often untold story of enslaved populations and milk and butter production on a large plantation that was close to urban markets, active between the 1820s and 1860s. We share this information with the public in many ways. The Henry Ford has a living history farm that includes dual purpose Devon cattle. We share our information through our digital collections, through blogs and expert sets that function basically as virtual exhibits. And we also, for 10 seasons between 2014 and 2023, have sponsored CBS's Innovation Nation with Mo Rocca. I'll share a clip on milking here in a moment, dramatized with the title of How Milk Changed the World. Uh, this was from season 10 and aired first in October of 2023. But on our Henry Ford website, we include these links to these blogs, expert sets, and, and digital collections that tell us more about milking over time and explores a little bit more deeply some of the themes that are evident in, in the Innovation Nation clip. So here's the clip. Okay, I'm gonna dial the time machine back just a few years when the word milk meant pretty much one thing. There was no soy, no almond, hemp, oat, or cashew, but there was chocolate. Mm. Yes, there was a time when milk came mainly from bovine. It's a fact. Humans are mammals and mammals nurse their young. It's also a fact that mammals can drink other mammals' milk and not only like it, but thrive on it. Every mammal gives milk, but those that commercially produce, there's a top five. So it's cattle, bovines, and then water buffalo, and they account for 96%, and then goats and sheep and yaks. Humans have milked animals for about 10,000 years. We've all heard the question, got milk? The answer is a big yes, because we've been drinking it for a long time. What's the schedule for milking? Yeah. I hoofed it over to Greenfield Get Village to milk more information out of the Henry Ford's Curator of Agriculture and the Environment, Deborah Reed. Mo, eager to introduce you to Marigold. Well, hello, Marigold. Very nice to meet you. She's a shorthorn that's had her first calf, three weeks old. And this is morning milking. How does milking work? Mm, it's a process. <laughs> Cow comes into the stall, has to settle down. She's been holding it like a storage oh, tank. Oh, she's been holding it sort of up. Yeah. Got it. And now uh, she's going to let her milk down. Yes. Relax the muscles so that the milk can actually leave the udder. Uh, so that takes a little time and a oh, little look comfort. squirting. Yeah. Oh, you missed it once. No, no, sorry. Oh, I don't, it'll don't. happen again. She can hold as much as a gallon and a half. Don't mean to be a backseat milker. I'm just sort of watching. There's a mutual dependency at work here because the cow holds milk and wants to let it down twice a day for comfort. They depend upon their offspring to do that, or in our case, humans and or technology. Why was milking important on small family farms? That milk is useful for children, and that milk supplements the need for proteins and fats, liquids. The milking of cows spurred really a big agribusiness, is that right? Populations in cities and that craving for milk and butter and cheese, how do you get that into a place where there are no cows? By the mid 20th century, milking parlors and other automated milking machines become more common. The ones I've seen are large, can hold 30 cows at a time. They just keep revolving. One cow after another, you can milk 10,000 cows on a system like that in a day. It's robotics that is doing the milking there. With a human attendant and human observers and humans to make sure everything's working. If you think science and automation have curtailed the symbiotic relationship between humans and farm animals, think again. Over 130 million people still raise dairy animals across the globe. 
So rest assured, human hands will keep on milking until the cows come home. All museums can support a more balanced diet with milk interpretation based in historical resources. To do so, they can take into account age as represented by this German school milk bottle. And they can address changing duties for milk and milking and milk processing over time and affirm the reasons why those changes occurred. Historical resources provide a lens to help us look more deeply into the culture of milk and how race or ethnicity or economics affects culture around milk and its by the processing of its byproducts. And then the role of public health played uh, had significance historically as it does today as policy relative to dairy cattle testing and dairy sanitation, among other things, helps ensure purity of milk and reduces the, the potential of disease transmissions. So I thank you for your attention and here's to your health and may your milk taste good. Thank you. We have the honor of presenting a communication to your association entitled Cheese Cookery in the Museum, Technical and Cultural Study of Traditional Cheesemaking Equipment from the Musée des Civilisations de l'Europe et de la Méditerranée. My name is Dominique Frère. I am professor at the Université de Bretagne Sud, specialist of the protohistoric and ancient artifacts. My colleague, Edouard de Lobry, is ethnologist at the Musée des Civilisations Européennes et Méditerranéennes specialist of the material culture of the traditional European and Mediterranean rural world. Last year, the Museum, based in Marseille, celebrated the 10th anniversary of its foundation. Here to the famous Musée des Arts et Traditions Populaires, it houses some of the largest ethnological collections from France and the Mediterranean. These collections include dairy processing equipment on structures from the 18th century to the present day. The scientific program we are presenting concerns the paleo chisology or archaeo chisology based on material sources. The cheese making objects on, more specifically, dairy crockery. Firstly, the origins and objectives of the program will be presented, followed by the methodological approach and we will finish by an example of our results. As an archaeologist, I have been working on the ancient Mediterranean for over 30 years, specializing in Greek and Etruscan ceramics. I study the contents of ceramics using a scientific approach to identify their use and function. A multidisciplinary approach combining morphological characteristics detailed observation of traces of use on chemical analysis of the contents enabled to propose a functional typology of the ceramics. There are many functional categories linked to daily life and rituals. One category has been identified but, with a few exceptions, has not been archaeologically investigated. These are the artifacts of cheese production and consumption. Cheese, in its fresh or aged form, is a very important daily food in ancient and medieval times. But we find it hard to get to grips with the technical and sensory realities of these ancient cheeses. We have iconographic sources on ceramic molds that tell us about the shapes and sizes of the cheeses. We also have textual sources, in particular the economic texts of Columella and Palladius, which tell us about the methods of production and conservation. These are not recipes, but instructions for making two main types of cheese, one fresh and the other aged. This letter is not a mature cheese, 
but a long keeping cheese that needs to be preserved in dried vegetables, honey, vinegar or brine. And when it becomes too hard, methods are given for refreshing heat. The aims of our program are Firstly, to identify and reconstruct the technical objects used in cheese production over the long term. And secondly, to retrace the traditional gestures, processes and steps involved in making different ancient cheeses. We began with the help of two young designers by reconstructing the polyphemous cheese rack, a cheese rack painted on an etrus canvas depicting the encounter between Ulysse and Polyphemus, the Cyclops. Her mastery is well known. The monstrous Cyclops dismembers on its Ulysse companion. To escape him and get out of the cave in which they were trapped, the Greeks offered wine to the Cyclops and took advantage of his drunkenness to poke out his eye. What is often overlooked is that the Cyclops is not just a Ideus barbarian, he is also a shepherd who knows all about cheese making. Homer's text is very precise about the steps taken by Polyphemus to make his cheeses. In addition to Homer's literary description, the Etrus canvas shows a removable cheese rack typical of the Mediterranean in the 7th century BC. I ordered several dozen replicas of Greek, Gallic and Roman ceramics related to dairy processing to reconstruct ancient cheeses using experimental archaeology and test how polyphemous cheese rack was used. Juliette, the designer who reconstructed the cheese rack, used the expression reviving the ghost, which gave us the idea of reviving the ghost of lost cheeses from antiquity to the 19th century. It was necessary to fill the gaps in our knowledge with information drawn from three complementary resources. Firstly, the material culture based on archaeological and ethnological objects. Secondly, traditional cheese-making manuals from the late Middle Ages to the mid-19th century. Thirdly, ethnology in regions where ancestral ways of making cheese were practiced until the 20th century. In the case of cheese-making manuals, textual and iconographic sources testify to the continuity of manufacturing processes and the equipment used over several centuries. On a local scale, invaluable technical information is provided on the different ways in which rustic cheeses were made. For our knowledge of material culture, a technical study of the museum collection enables us to construct a functional and chronological typology. The objects provide information about the manufacturing processes through their technical characteristics and the traces of use that have marked them, as well as through the organic evidence that reveals, such as whey flows or cheesecloth residues. Fragments of horsehair cheesecloth, for example, can be found in 18th century ceramics. The database created during the study will soon be available online with descriptions, drawings and pictures. Last year, we carried out two ethnographic missions on traditional cheesemaking in Sardinia and Corsica, and we plan to do the next one in Georgia. Our theoretical knowledge of ancient cheese making and our experience of making traditional cheeses means that we can carry out numerous long-term trials of each step in the production process, from heating the milk to smoking and storing in jars.
Finally, as example of the rediscovery of ancient practices documented from antiquity to the middle of the 20th century, the question of eating milk with hot stones. What are the benefits of this technique? Does this eating method change the taste of the cheese? Our documentary on ethnological research, confirmed by our manufacturing experiences, enable us to answer these questions. Shepherds, in Corsica and the Basque Country, use different types of stones that they carefully collected from their surroundings. In particular, they use ferruginous rocks, which they believe to have medicinal properties. When these hot stones were suddenly immersed in the milk, they immediately heated it up and covered it with a fine layer of ash. This gave a slight smoky flavor to the milk and later to the cheese. This test is accentuated over time when the container holding the milk is made of wood. In fact, the contact of the burning pebbles marks the bottom of the container, which retains the smell of burning and communicates it to the milk on cheese. We thank you for your attention. We regret that we are unable to be present to answer your questions, but we are at your disposal and you can contact us by email. Thank you. Hello, I am here to talk on the traditional dairy farming in India. I am Rajeshwaran, a veterinarian with a management background and I have completed my doctorate in public policy in Lashtank. Presently, I am working as a professor on, for livestock management and public policy. Yeah. I have 40, 40 years of experience in the Indian dairy sector, working on dairy farms, breeding farms, frozen cement stations, embryo transfer lab, etc., and running business of milk with through cooperatives as well. And micro, at the micro level, I have trained about few lakh of animal uh, farmers in dairy animal management. And I do I now do macro level analysis, pocket policy analysis, and provide consultancy. Happy to be here with you today. Yeah, the, the traditional the Indian dairy farming consists of three types of animals: the Indian cows, the Indian buffaloes, and the crossbreds, which have been recently introduced into the system over the last fifty years. The productivity per animal is given there, and of course, the crossbred is the highest, and the buffaloes comes later, and the Indian cows slightly. Buffaloes have a higher fat percentage in their milk. Even today, 50% of the milk comes from the 55% of the milk comes from buffaloes, continues to come from buffaloes over the last 50 years. There's that The cow-buffalo ratio has not changed. The Indian cow and crossbred cow, that has changed. Yes, Indian cows was of first. It was only cows, Indian cows. Now, crossbred cows have really have contributed around 25% and Indian cows have come down to 20% from 45% earlier. Generally, majority of the farmers are small size holdings, having, having just one or three animals each. And therefore, because of the cap, small size, they have zero market power and invariably are price takers. I will complete my session and then give you, show you a few slides, photographs which I have taken in the field just to emphasize the points which I am going to mention here now. Yeah, the five advantage points which we look at from which look at this particular uh, subject is from the nutrition, from economics angle, social angle, cultural angle, and then we how it was how it has been integrated with agriculture as such. Starting nutrition, dairy animals were generally the traditional dairy farming is basically for home consumption of milk and milk products which you make at home on their own. You be yogurt or ghee, etc. He's made at home basically. The reason is that it has an assured trace back mechanism. In terms of quality, you are known as an assured quality. 
and there is no cash outflow from the household to the outside world. These are two reasons why the, the, there is a high per capita consumption of milk with households which have animals vis-a-vis -vis households which do not have animals. It's actually double, nearly double no, the per capita consumption is double vis-a-vis -vis people who don't have animals. Coming to economics, the major constraint is of course there no, docu no documentation of a data because it's one single animal, two animals you have. So it's extremely difficult to, for a farmer to keep track of the technical and especially the financial data on that animal as such. And he has limited resources and therefore time is also very limited. Because of this, longitudinal data is absolutely absent. I just talked about the liters per day. It's a cross-sectional data. Developed countries who have gone ahead in the dairy sector have already talk, always talked about either lactation total or the lifetime total, which is the way to go about in terms of butter fat and in terms of the solids not fat, total fat yield per uh, lifetime and total butter non-fat. Non Invariably because of cash constraints, there is farmer does not have any money to pay for any of the inputs which may be required and that's the reason they prefer to get inputs which are literally free of cost. Further, because of the low or the absence of market power, they are forced to do credit sales, not just for the milk, but also for the animals itself. And therefore, the their cash position continues to be in a precarious condition as such. And all this results to a dairy, they become very highly risk covers and they do not want to take any further challenges or which may hinder their, even the existing status as such. And it's like many, uh, funnily we say, it's a, you put in, they are put in liquid oxygen. The oxygen will not allow you to die and the, and the liquid will not, and the liquid may, uh, oxygen will not allow you to die and the liquid will make you die. Social, from the social side, animal, every animal, because of just two animals or one animal in the household is actually a member of the household as such. And the dairy activity is highly men-centric because they are staying at home literally 24 by 7. The gents, the male force invariably go out for labor, work as a, and other activities outside the car. And therefore, they are literally on 24 by 7 duty or duty to look after the animals. Cultural animals become part of the all festivals which are functions are this thing. The animal becomes a part and parcel of that activity as such. And of course, use of dung is a very common thing for either for flooring or for the wall. And the urine is also used as a pesticide, etc. Of course. The one cow, one cow milk for babies which are just being weaned is a, is a tradition which has been culturally been followed for long for years, especially even today in the villages, not in the urban areas as such, where when the uh, child is born and the mother goes, he is going back to the, the in-law's place after the birth, maybe two, three months or four months. And the baby is supposed to be weaned by six months or eight months. The lady is given also a cow for to be reared and with, with the calf and so that the baby will get milk from only that cow. This is a practice which I've been practicing for a long time because it's also even in the rural segments, it is weaning as such. Integration agriculture. Very closely interlinked with the agriculture is the life dairy animal rearing. The dung, the urine, all go back to the field in some way or the other. Ensure the farm ensures that it goes back to the farm uh, field. And from the field, whatever is waste is agriculture waste is taken from the or grown 
goes back to the animal for feeding as such. So it's a closed loop, very closed loop with literally no cash outflow. So it could be within the household itself, if the farmer has a land of or taken on a lease, or at least within the village as such. So this link is a very close, in the traditional livestock keeping, dairy animal keeping in India, this close, it's a very, very close to loop. And this is being tampered, of course, for the time, with by many, very many means. Yeah, feeding is, as I told you, because of the cash crunch. At that small farmer level, inks which are normal are normally preferred to be free of cost. So that when the lady of the house or the farm, uh, gents of the house go out, they cut some grass which is available on the way and bring it and put it, give it for the animal to eat. All agriculture waste, apart from what the human consumption human consumes, everything is given to the animal. That way, it's a it's a very comp compact system as such. Man being on the top of the food chain, he ha he or she has the first first uh, charge on anything which is grown. What is left is all eaten by the given to the animal for all, uh, dairy animals. So all greens from the waste land is given and cultivated for is a very very few cases where it is cultivated. In terms of market. Very clear distinction between rural market and urban market. Rural market either prefers cow milk or buffalo milk, and within cow milk, Indian cow milk, breed cow milk or crossbred cow milk. There's a very clear preference, and they only buy that. That's around 45 to 50 uh, to of the uh, 40. Uh, it's a quite a sum, quite a sum. The remaining which is sold, expert surplus which gets into the urban market is converted into different. All these are mixed. The one, the ones that comes to the urban area, the cow milk, all the three types of milk are mixed and becomes a, it's purely fat and SNF based uh, story. And double toned, standardized, full cream, uh, toned, etc. is sold as. So it is not sold as cow milk. Recently, there's a trend suddenly they're coming into a cow milk or buffalo milk. But generally, it's a purely, uh, these are the main uh, classifications which milk is sold. The strength of this, so we'll just do a short SWOT analysis. There are 73 breeds of cows and buffaloes in India. And all of them, every one of them produce A2 milk. And all are suited to the local climate and fodder availability, of course. Heat resistant, domesticated well, and easily handled by the women of the thing. And low input systems, I already told you that. Low. There's no cost, literally zero cost. Weaknesses of course, lack of market legitimation to the farmer because they are also distributed across the country in a very uh, very sparse manner, information to reach them is very difficult. And therefore, information is asymmetry plays a big role and therefore the middlemen come into picture. Negative cash flow situation is a is the norm in a, for a small farmer situation. And invariably, they, most of them are always under debt. And therefore, because they are under debt, they are, they are unable to leverage debt further. As well. So you are either just hanging on to that uh, Minimal living conditions. And therefore, preventive cover. Preventive, preventive cover obviously is a long term story. So, nobody wants to take up any preventive action, uh, spend money on preventive cover. And again, low insurance. Therefore, there's no money to see, insure the animal in terms of uh, mortality or mortality. And animals, as I told you, they are very thinly spread. These are the reasons. Threats, of course, the existing market players themselves will not allow the uh, traditional. Though the traditional market market continues to thrive, existing big market players would are trying to definitely move them away from this uh, traditional market uh, system to a commercial system as such, like the developed countries. There are pros and cons about it. Lack of trained personnel on health management. Absolutely, there's an absence of people who can help a farmer to rear healthy animals. The veterinarians are invariably involved in treatment of animals who are sick. And communicable diseases are, are an issue because, of, because you don't have money to pay for the preventive access. Communicable diseases are common. Mastitis, of course, is a common issue. It's not just not here, everywhere, all the countries, because of the low uh, hygienic conditions. And it's not a glamorous. Uh, job as such, day day and reading, and therefore youth are very not very attracted to this place. Opportunities are, of course, growing demand for you to milk. 
and both in the domestic market and the international market, huge market. And emerging niche, niche markets are huge. Even presently, even the A2 milk, if they are, if you are able to sell A2 milk, you get a clearly a 100% premium over the milk which is normally sold in urban uh, pockets. And that's a consumer are ready for the premium product. Easily to the, the farms, those uh, farmers are even easily be formed into distributed autonomous organizations very easily because the women groups are already there and government also supports entrepreneurship among, amongst the youth as well. Yeah, these are some of the photographs. Housing, there's nothing as housing. <laughs> just under the tree, they are seen. They're quite happy. Uh, hey, just have a bit of shade is required as such. And these are one single animal uh, story, as I told you. Just uh, one animal is... Uh, and they actually, it's a child. I mean, they rear it from the childhood and uh, most of them are reared from the childhood. And this is the market. Uh, yogurt being uh, manufactured, made at home and being taken to the market as a... Uh, and this is the present market um, milk being taken to urban market where the cow milk and buffalo milk comes see, comes get gives and mixed up and then gets into uh, the urban market a standardized milk or uh, double tone milk, tone milk, etc. And this is the uh, hay being transferred, straw being transferred over, over uh, long distance. There's a good market for it. Uh, though it's not though it's not uh, uh, nutritionally much uh, useful. This is the animal market where animals are being traded uh, and uh, traders invariably come and sell it. And it's not the individual farmers. So he's also a trader actually who has brought the animal, bought the animal and brought it here for sales as such. So that middlemen play a big role in this, uh, in the animal market. This is a biogas unit uh, being demonstrated by a farmer who's been using it for the last 25 years. It's not very prevalent, but uh, these are opportunities available as this is a cow dung being stored as a sticks made and dried and uh, used for cooking at uh, home. And that's a normal practice and the biogas is a unit uh, recent. Uh, I mean, it's a good uh, thing, but not very highly useful. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Klaus Krupp. I am the manager of the Larisham Laboratory for Experimental Archaeology, which is an open air um, museum site in southern Germany. And I want to contribute to this World Milk Day today with a short presentation about the so-called three-purpose cattle. And I want to talk about the role that cows have and their milk as well as their meat, as well as their workforce they are providing as a very, very important resource for so many um, communities around the globe, not only in the past, but also for today. And I want to start off with a little case study about um, draft cows in Germany. When we have a look at this map of Germany in 1936, um, you will see this um, black dots as, um, well, counted draft cows, meaning that we had kind of a um, nationwide survey that was conducted um, in which it was determined which farmers or which people were using bulls, oxen, or cows. And this map shows the extent of cows that were used for draft purposes. That also means that at the same time they were used as dairy cows and uh, in the end also butchered. The interesting aspect of this is that um, in that period of time we had about 2.5 million draft cows in Germany. That is more than um, horses were used for draft purposes at that time. So there was a high role of these um, cows for the purpose of draft power. The reason why that was, was the high number of small-scale farms throughout um, the country, and especially in the mountainous areas. So it was a necessity for farmers to use and utilize their 
cattle, especially the cows, and often they only had cows, um, as well as possible, and therefore um, they also um, put them to work. Um, there are calculations within PhD theses of the 18th and 19th, no, the 19th and 20th century, to be more precise, that clearly show that um, there was a whole science science branch that worked on the question of how much work can we put on a cow in order to not lose the valuable milk that um, she is providing and uh, at the same time do not any harm um, to the animal. So that is um, very interesting how much effort was put in to, um, well, take care of these cows in the best possible way in order to have them provide that three purpose I am talking about. Part of that development was that in the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century, um, they, the manufacturers then developed a specific harness that was well adjustable and well suited for cows, and that is the so-called three-pet collar. The three-pet collar was, and still is, as you can see in the picture here, um, very well adjustable to the overall physique of the animal, and therefore um, it is of high value for um, the welfare of the animals and the overall health that will provide a longer lifetime um, of the animal and also a longer working lifetime of the animal. This brings me finally to the point that these cattle breeds that were used for these three purpose um, needs um, are of high value also for today when we think about dairy production and also for well re calibrations within our current agricultural systems um, around the globe we see the need of more small-scale farming again and in that respect these old heritage breeds some of them are shown in the the pictures here, Vosk cattle from France, Raging Grey cattle um, from Switzerland, or the um, Red Mountain um, breed from Germany, they are all still used um, as three-purpose cattle. They have a very high lifetime performance. That means they provide milk over not as high and as much as the industrial breeds, but um, over the lifetime when they have um, 18 calves uh, and live to be 21, um, they they have a high lifetime performance. And their, their longevity is very um, um, important. They are easy calving and also they have very good character traits. So um, to sum up, it is important in my opinion that when we think about um, dairy production, the role of milk um, in uh, our society, that we also have to follow up on a holistic approach, meaning that we see um, cattle that provide the milk in this case as um, best as possible as three use animals because um, that will ensure the livelihoods of many more people if we can also think of them as a workforce to do farming, small-scale farming around the globe. Thank you for your attention.